Okay, well, Warren, you talked about uh, bookmakers at punters. Are you a punter yourself? Um, I am the biggest non-punter you've ever met. Um, I will have $50 on a football game that I'm with friends type thing. Um, I do occasionally back horses back because I do, as I said earlier, I do no form. I have absolutely no idea how long most races are. Um, I just think that my business is, is creating the, the business, not, you know, the prices are easy to figure out. Really, if you look around the ring, there are very smart bookmakers with prices and you can sort of, you know, crib off of them. But um, no, I'm not a big punter, but it's, it's funny. I have occasionally backed a horse for no reason other than something in the back of my head sort of says, yeah, you probably should have something back on this one. And my, my memory seems to serve me fairly well with that. Okay, there's something I want to go back to. Um, a lot of racecourse bookmakers over here be watching this and thinking, well, that's all very well. You can work in a poor pitch. Everyone that's worked on a racecourse, especially in off meeting, knows that the only volume of money for a horse is probably lively. So if you're stood there on the back row offering a good price, how do you stop getting picked off? I mean, you can go there and lose bundles just because you're in a bad pitch offering good prices because the only money is the sharp money. How, how, what do you sort of do to counteract that problem? I don't agree with that, to be perfectly honest, because what's a bad pitch? I mean, the other day I was at Caulfield. I was on the worst stand on the course, and I wrote, I think, the most tickets for cash off the ground. If, you're, if the people on the race course, which they quickly learn, you consistently offer good prices and will let people on whether they're, you know, there's a trainer here, Tony Romeo is not a very successful trainer, but he walked up to me one day and the ring was a hundred to one a horse of his and his horse should have been 10,000 to one. In my opinion, um, he was hopeless. I put up 500 to one and he walked up and he said, can I have a hundred on it? And I said, sure. And then another one of his guys said, can I have a hundred? Yeah, another one. And by the time I was done, I was at working at this absolutely nothing meeting in the middle of nowhere. And on the race, I was holding $650 and standing one for about 200,000. It was just, it was just ridiculous. And as they were walking away, I said to him, I said, Tony, I think I could buy your whole stable with the amount of money you'll win if this thing wins. And he went uh, about six times, you know, but just because who's smart at the end of the day? I mean, there's a few punters that, yes, will beat you. But the smartest punters in the world are winning three, four, five percent on turnover. So let me ask you a question. I mean, if I bet a guy to win two thousand dollars and he's going to win three percent off me and I've just found out what he likes by him having that bet, aren't I better prepared to bet the rest of the customers for that race? And it's actually an advantage. So everyone wants to say that, you know, oh, they're so smart. No one, they can't be just because you can't beat them, it doesn't mean that, that what you learn from their business doesn't make you more viable in the long run. Okay, so how many, how many professional punters do you think would operate on the course at full-time backers? Um, I think probably in the city, I'd say there's probably about six or seven on course because Right now, there's this incredible uh, influx of online bookies. In the last, with COVID, probably 40 bookmakers have gone online. So it used to be sort of the big English corporates and a few uh, Australian corporates. And, you know, one of the people at some point you should speak to is Tristan Merlihan, who runs Top Sport, which is one of the leading online bookies here. And to be perfectly honest, um, probably the best in the business at it because he bets all the pros and not only does he bet them he has bonus programs that he gives to the pros he doesn't pull the you know the punches with anyone because he understands that in the long run a great service gets a great reputation creates a ton of business and that's really what we're all about at the end of the day you know successful bookmakers that are here for a long time have one thing in common, the general public, the punters are comfortable betting with them and like what you offer them.
this, uh, some of this been well, 20 years now almost, bookmakers on course stop betting, hedging with each other. They just now hedge straight into the, what they call the machine, the exchange. Is that something that happens on course in Australia now? It does. I, I think that it's an embarrassment that people do that. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that I don't back things back. I do. Uh, we all will. But when you start your business with one of the companies, uh, one of the big betting systems in England tried to come out here. And the, the one thing that we all thought was a joke when they showed us the system was the green button. You know, where you at jump time, you could push the green button, it would back horses and lay them and turn everything into a profit. You know, um, and that just to me is insane. The idea of bookmaking is that, you know, it's a little bit of I'm taking you on and there's a competitiveness to it and it's good natured. And it's but if there's no risk, I might as well honestly go run a McDonald's because. It, it, it sure as hell would be easier work than jumping in the car and driving all around the country. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of people talk about the green up button. Um, yeah, with disdain. But I, I don't think English bookmakers use it as much as people think they do, but there are definitely some that only go for that. Anyway, now you've said that um, some of the on-course business, I've, I've been told that the on-course business has got a lot worse in the last decade. But you feel it will make a comeback. What, why do you think that is? Well, first off, um, my turnover figures on course has grown every year since 2014. Um, some of that definitely is related to the fact that I work more meetings. But I think it also relates to the fact that there are people coming to the course that are willing to have a bet if you're willing to let them have a bet. And not every person who wants to have $1,000 on a horse or $2,000 on a horse is a genius. They might own it, you know, or they might just be a guy who's been working in the mines for a month and he's made a fair chunk of money and coming to the races and having 500 bucks is his idea of an entertaining day. So to go to Moe and have 5,000 to 500 on something because he likes it is, and if you, if you don't play those guys, well, then, you know, if every one of those that walks up, you say, oh, just to win the thousand, which is what you have to bet them at the small country meetings, they don't come back up to you. Uh, they go to the guy who will let them on. And there's percentage there. You have it. You definitely can, can, you know, if you're a little bit aware, you can catch a few right and lay a few, you know at the unders and as we talk about Rob again, but Rob famously gave me one piece of advice that successful bookies lay them at the unders and back punt, successful punters back them at the overs. And even if you're the best punter in Australia, if I can get you to take it from me on your second trip or third trip through the ring to back it, you have really no advantage, so. Okay, now you said that, um that you think that the industry in Australia has been damaged by bad bookies. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? I just think that too many of our bookies, um, as I go back to, don't understand that, you know, they used to, when I first came to Australia in the early 80s and went to the races, the bookies used to talk about the punters as, oh, the mugs. Well, if, you're, if you treat your customer, whether you run a restaurant or, you know, a carpet cleaning business or whatever, if you treat your customers as the mugs, they're going to quickly draw away from you. And there's still too, there's not a great influx of young bookies. And the young bookies, I think, are much better than some of the older ones. But, you know, they're also, we get a little jaded when you're holding $100,000 on a Wednesday you know, when you were in the mid eighties and now you're holding 20, you know, you sort of think, well, what am I doing this for? And some of them don't, you know, handle it as well as others, but um, it just comes down to me at the end of the day that if you treat people with respect, like I say to every person when they have a bet with me, as I'm handing them the ticket, good luck. 
And so many people say, oh, you don't want me to have good luck. You don't want my horse to win. Well, the truth of the matter is when I have the bet with them, I don't know if I want that horse to win or lose. By the time they jump, I might be cheering like hell for your horse. So, and, also, and to my way of thinking, it's like we've all sold a used car in our life. If you sell your used car, no one in the world, unless you're a psychopath, hopes that their car blows up on the guy as he's driving it out of your driveway. You hope the car runs well for them. So, you know, hey, I sold it to you at the price I wanted to sell it. You bought it at the price you wanted to buy it. We've made a trade where both of us are happy. Good luck, I can't change the result. If your horse wins, it wins. You know, and you're gonna come back and bet with me again because you know, we were respectful when we took the bet. We're going to be respectful when we're paying you after the bet. And, you know, one of the things that I would say is, you know, next year when we come to Ascot, I hope some of your viewers come to talk, Rob Stand because I'll be there clerking away and, and, you know, sort of experience it because we do try and make it a little bit more fun. Okay, now finally, that's a great note to uh, to end on. But finally, so you're going to Royal Ascot with Rob. You're going to make a book in England. Have you got to where you want to be with your business at the moment? Have you reached the where you're happy, or have you still got burning ambitions to do a bit more? Oh no, I have very burning ambitions to do a bit more. Um, a couple of years ago, I was very involved with tennis, um, not from a betting point of view, but view, but from an integrity point of view where I've created a company with some others called Integrigator about, um, and in the commission about the tennis betting, we were in there that, you know, they should split up bet radar who puts the prices out and someone for integrity. Um, I think that that's a big aspect of it going forward, but I'd like to expand into America now that they're legalizing it. But, uh, you know, that's a little bit beyond my financial means at this stage. Um, I'd love to, um, I offered Rob to buy into the stand with him. Um, he wasn't, he just wanted, didn't want that at this point, but maybe next time I'll buy a stand at say Goodwood, um, cause it's a place I'd love to field. Um, I'd love to field in news. I'd love to field in a thousand places, but you know, my father went to Goodwood in the fifties when he was playing tennis at Wimbledon and was talking about how fantastic it was. I've gone there once when on a non-race day to see it, but I'd love to go to Goodwood. I'd love to work at Royal Ascot in, under my own name. Um, I'd love to one day work in Paris and, and have a license to work there or work at the Kentucky Derby. Um, uh, there's a hell of a lot of racetracks I haven't visited and a hell of a lot of places I haven't gone that you know I'd like to go and, and experience their racing. Um, I used to go to Wentworth Park Dog, uh, sorry, Wimbledon Dogs with my dad after going to the tennis when that existed. And we just had, I had such a great time and going down, you know, with the bookies right there against the, the course. And it, it's just, it was an electric experience for a young guy. And uh, I want to have more of those because I, every track I go to that I haven't been to, I get excited as I get to the gate. Yeah. So no, I'm far from, uh, I'm 57 this year. Uh, I'd like to probably see another 200 race courses I haven't seen before uh, they decide that I've had enough. Well, that's brilliant. Well, we'll see you at Royal Ascot next year anyway. On Rob's, uh, Absolutely. On Rob's Absolutely. And, uh, thank, thank you ever so much for the interview. And I look forward to seeing you next year. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And listen, next time when we are over there, um, you'll have to come to Wimbledon or Queens as my guest. Fantastic. Because that's that, that's a that's a ticket I can actually get. <laughs> well, I'll definitely take you up on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.